get in the museum is proximity to the objects and I think nothing at all can match that. But to actually stand beside a stone statue or to walk around a stone statue to almost feel the reflection of light off it and heat off it is a, a, a great study I believe. Victor Harris has lived in Japan, is a fluent Japanese speaker, is married to a Japanese woman and he teaches kendo. His assistant, Paul, studies with him both in class and at the museum. Both are passionate about samurai swords. In Japan, traditionally, kendo, or swordsmanship, has been a spiritual study, as indeed has been the subject of the Japanese sword. This is an example of the um, fully developed, curved Japanese sword. It was made by the master smith Yoshikane of Bizen province, present-day Okayama prefecture, around the end of the 12th century. It's made by a very sophisticated technology of repeatedly folding the steel over and over and over and over again. Um, when the blade is finally formed into its sword-like shape, it is coated overall with a layer of clay. Uh, that is partially removed along what is to be the cutting edge. The whole is then heated to the colour of the moon in February or August and plunged into a bath of water. When the blade is polished, its intrinsic beauty is visible in the very many varied shades, hues and textures of the crystalline structures along its edge. The beauty in this sword was not contrived by the smith. It was a kind of a joint effort, if you like, between the smith and the gods of the forge, or the smith and nature. <laughs> Yoshihara Yoshindo sensei about five years ago at the British Museum. He came to visit and I was introduced to him and then I visited his, his forge in Japan uh, where he, he showed me sword forging techniques um, and then since then we've stayed in touch and I knew he was very popular in America so I decided to do an exhibition about his family. So the sword is often um, portrayed as just a weapon in movies um, when it is much more than that. It is, it is a beautiful art object, it is a, it is a social icon um, and it is a, a spiritual object. They're, they're made for sh shrines and for the kami, for the gods to reside in. The sword originally was a gift from the gods in Japan, and this is why it outlasted the gun, and, and it's still, the craft is still alive in Japan today. Mm, there's many differences, uh, from the, the purification of the, of the steel, from the raw product. It's made from a product called Sartis, sandine, which is uh, smelted in a, in a furnace called a tatara. Um, then the purified steel was taken in kind of fist sized chunks, crushed, uh, flattened, and then the steel is sorted uh, for them, the optimum amounts of carbon within the steel. Uh, there's two, um, they make two piles out of this. One is, is lower carbon, which is a softer steel, one is higher carbon, but a harder steel. And both these piles are made into blocks and folded repeatedly between 10 and 20 times. Then um, the harder steel is made into like a jacket for the, the core steel, the softer steel, and it's wrapped around the core steel, and then it's hammered out into the shape of a blade, uh, covered in clay, which is scraped off along the cutting edge, it's heated to the colour of the moon in February and August, and then quenched into water, which gives it a very hard cutting edge, but the back of the blade is slightly flexible, which allows it to bend slightly on impact, making it very, very efficient because it can hold a razor's edge, but it's still slightly flexible, so it will not break. While leaving Chad to his own devices, I've come to meet up with Paul Martin, a former British Museum curator. He moved to Japan to immerse himself in the world of the samurai sword. So if, if I were to ask you, what do you actually defines the Japanese sword, the katana? What's, what's the qualities? What? A good sword should not bend, should not break, and should cut well. Yeah. But the Japanese sword has all of these attributes, but it's much more powerful than a mere weapon. It's a spiritual icon. It's an, a beautiful art object. It's a, a symbol of the Japanese nation. 
But what is so special about it? Well, one thing is the materials it's made from. High in the mountains, six hours from Tokyo, iron in the form of a black sand is collected from the riverbeds and is smelted with charcoal to form a unique kind of steel, tamahagani. And a Japanese sword is not considered authentic unless it is made from this. Tamahagani is produced only once a year. They create a two-ton block of it, and it is only made available to the elite swordsmiths. But to the Japanese, the importance of the katana is so much more than this mystic metal. They believe that a warrior's soul lives in his sword. And from the very outset, every process is carried out with ritual. The tamahagani is created in a purpose-built structure called a tatara. This is astonishing, isn't it? It's an amazing place. What exactly is going on in here? Every uh, 20 to 30 minutes, they're putting in large amounts of sand iron and charcoal. And uh, this goes on regularly for 72 hours. 72 hours? Yes. That's astonishing. And it's always attended? Always attended. And presumably, the, the, the reason for that is because they want the iron sand to absorb the carbon to make that alloy, which is steel. It strikes me that it looks like an altar. But the whole atmosphere in here, from everybody, the spectators and the workers, is very reverential, very religious. Yeah, it is, it is definitely a, a spiritual place. The real payoff is going to happen very early tomorrow morning, when those walls bulge and it, it gives birth to the Tamahogany. And so I'm going to get some sleep and come back bright and early. Finding the train was easy, once I found the train station. On the way to Okayama to see what the Japanese have to say about sword making. Meanwhile, I'm back at five in the morning to witness the final steps of this ancient ritual. The specialized steel has been smelting in the furnace for three days now. At last, the men start to break down the clay walls. Inside is the block of tamahagami, the molten metal that Japanese swordsmiths have relied on for centuries. Inside there, is the tamahagani, this unique material that makes the unique sword, the katana. So they're now raking the charcoal off the top layer. The heat is unbelievable. If you think you felt the heat from a fire, from a coal fire, a wood fire, heat of molten metal is scorching the face. As day breaks, the final coals are raked away to reveal a solidified mass of metal. And at the core of this cocoon is the pure tamahagani. Having made his way down from the mountains, Paul Martin caught up with me in Okayama. And he has graciously agreed to exercise some of his hard-earned cachet and introduce me into a tightly closed circle of elite Japanese swordsmiths who are still using the techniques perfected by their ancestors and passed along through the generations. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Master Ono Yoshimitsu. Our blade begins life as a rough, coarse piece of metal which was produced in the very same foundry by the very same process that Mike has just witnessed. That's full of impurities right now? I mean, it no, looks it's, like no, it's, it's... It's very pure. It's 99% pure steel. A Japanese sword is made by wrapping a hard yet brittle U-shaped layer of steel around a softer but much tougher inner core. The hard steel will take and hold a razor edge but would shatter like glass without the support of the softer steel. Raw tamahagany is broken down into small chunks, which are then beaten into flat plates. And these flat plates are used to sort hard from soft. But just exactly how are the properties of each plate judged? What doesn't break cleanly becomes the core steel. And what breaks cleanly is the outer steel. Right, because this is harder because it shatters. Yeah. Right, like a glass yeah. would shatter. Okay. Okay, so it's really a selection process. So here we are, smashing steel chunks to bits, sorting as we go. If it shatters, it will become the hard cutting edge. And if it bends and tears, we'll use it to form the tough inner core. Once having sorted all our plates, we are now ready to forge weld them together. So we take all the itsy bitsy bits and we stack them up like pieces of a 3D puzzle. I'm still in Japan to witness the final step in the creation of a samurai sword. The polish. It's the ultimate finishing touch. The polish is an essential part of the blade. The finer the polish, the less the drag, the faster and cleaner the cut. 
I'm with Fujishiro Sensei, a master of the art. Each sword can take up to two weeks to bring to a full polish. He uses a series of ever finer polishing stones until he ends up with a paper thin wafer. Rubbing there, he can actually feel the grain yeah, he, of the blade. He, he I mean, that's, every that's the, the real art, isn't it? It doesn't get much closer to perfection than this. That's astonishing. Sensei, do my regato, Gajanas. Okay, time to go home and see what Chad's been up to. Well, there's an old joke in Japan, and it goes like this. A man walks into uh, a knife-making workshop, and um, what happens, Paul? I speak Japanese. He can't speak Japanese. He can't understand anyone. That's why we have Paul Martin with us. Paul Martin is my trusty patient interpreter. Wow. He's going to help me cross the cultural divide as I learn to craft a sushi knife. I'm Brian Unger. Hi. Making a razor-sharp knife that is both strong and flexible is a surprisingly difficult and complicated task. Kajira-san, a master knife maker, will instruct me on the methods essential to creating a strong, sharp knife. So tell me about the process. How does this begin? First, he attaches a piece of hard steel, a bar of soft steel, and then he, he welds that together. Kajira-san starts out with two different pieces of metal. One is soft iron, the other is high carbon steel. The secret to making a sturdy knife. Hardened high carbon steel is so rigid and unyielding that it breaks rather than bending. Watch. If you try the same thing with low carbon steel, it bends rather than breaking. A composite steel needs to be created. The high and low carbon steels have to be welded together. High carbon for strength near the sharpened side, low carbon for flexibility along the spine. Making composite steel requires intense heat. When the metals begin to glow red hot, the structure of their iron crystals changes, allowing carbon atoms to dissolve in them, like salt in water. This softens the metal so that it can be pounded or forged well together. The crystals have to become completely entangled. You can only forge a perfect chef knife if the heat is perfectly regulated. How hot is it inside the oven where he forges that steel? It's about 800 degrees. 800 degrees. On its way to more than 1200 degrees Celsius or 2200 Fahrenheit to weld these two pieces together. And this is all done without any thermometer or anything to tell him what the temperature is. He's yeah. just doing it all from just sort of how he's feeling the heat mm -hmm. and the color of the steel. And the color of the steel. Yeah. To, to say that these are handcrafted knives is almost an understatement. I mean, these are literally forged and shaped by hand from just crude steel. Yes. I mean, how many will he make in a day? He usually makes 12 a day. Just a, a dozen? Yeah. The belt hammer's pounding of the metal ensures flexibility. That's how the master does it. Now it's my turn. You want to do that bit? What? Attaching the, the hard steel to the bar. Do I want to attach the hard steel to the bar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just have the ambulance pull up outside and just wait for me. Is that a no? Hmm? <laughs> just say, Kajiro son. Thank you. No, I'm looking basically down the throat of a breathing dragon. Sounds like bacon frying. Sounds like bacon frying. A lot hotter. Yeah. You don't have to tell him every stupid thing I say. <laughs> this Japanese master is going to let me stamp out my own pieces of hard and soft metal. Oh, hi. He's going to leave you there on your own. He's going to leave me here on my own. Yeah. You think is Kajirasan? Is that is that a wise thing to do? <laughs> so I'm just gonna back off the heat with this lever here. Take this out. That's 
the hard part right there is turning it. So I've got to turn the knife. It's getting a little crooked. I don't know if you can see this, but Kajiro-san is wearing flip-flops. <laughs> Apparently the steel toe boot, really not a consideration. Oh, he wants me back here, so I'm like this. Joseph, how am I doing? Okay. Okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think he's lying, but you know. You can have that as a present. I can have this as a present? Yeah, he's gonna get it as a present. Really? Oh. I can? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. No one will want to use that knife anyway since I made it. The knife has to be ground down to a quarter of an inch thickness on its spine. This is the optimum width for a tool that needs to be strong, yet lightweight and flexible enough for the delicate work of slicing sushi. Then, it's stamped. This is really a very personal uh, step where the maker actually begins to write his name in the blade that says where the knife has been made. You know, who would want to use a sushi knife anyway made by someone from Dayton, Ohio? Well, the metal has its signature stamped in, but it's still a long, long way from being a real knife. Next, we have to prepare the steel to hold an edge. So with this clay soup here, the quenching process means it will have lasting strength and sharpness. Itsuo-san will actually apply sort of a porridge of, of water and clay to, to the blade. Once the clay dries, it's back into the fire, where the blade is heated until it glows bright red. So this is kind of a second stage of, of heating the knife. They're actually reheated after this clay has been rubbed on the knife and sort of hardened. Yeah. See him taking it in and out. He's trying to get an even temperature all the way along the blade. And then when he gets it to the right temperature, then he'll quench it into this pool of water here. In doing so, we are once again altering the molecular structure. Before heating, the steel contains tiny crystals of nearly pure iron, and its carbon is located outside those crystals. But at red heat, the carbon dissolves into the iron, and the steel becomes homogeneous. When you then quench the steel, the dissolved carbon atoms scramble frantically to get back out of the iron crystals, but they don't have time to escape. They're trapped. The resulting carbon-stuffed iron crystals are incredibly hard and at the heart of a good cutting edge. Coming up, we'll find out how using a knife this sharp can give you chills. <laughs> In Japan, we're learning from the masters how to make the strongest, sharpest sushi knife. Having created a strong blade, now it's time to get to the point of sharpening. We're going to give this knife its edge. At the moment, it's not quite a knife. So we find ourselves in this sort of quiet residential alleyway in Sakai, where finally this blade gets its character, this knife becomes a knife. Hey, bro. Hi there, I'm here to sharpen my knife. <laughs> I think I found the right place. Hi, my name is Brian. Nice to, me nice to meet you. Shinpei no, Ino has been honing blades for more than 35 years. Now, this needs to become a knife. Now, I have to ask you before we get started, why is the water that these blades are sto stored in so green? I mean, it looks like antifreeze. Oh, hey, to stop it from rusting. To stop it from rusting? Mm -hmm. The knives are raw metal. If exposed to the air around us, they begin to rust almost immediately. So they soak in a solution that halts corrosion. Sort of an Edward Scissorhands look going on over here. Now it's time to give our knife some real edge. For centuries, this has been the way these knives have been made, on a stone wheel. Okay. This was the first blade that we forged. 
and it has no edge on it and this is just after just a few minutes on, on the wheel where you can see the first edge has been applied. The qualities of this unique steel allow the sushi knife to be honed to a severe angle but unlike western style knives these are grinded by Japanese masters on just one side allowing for unmatched sharpness and precision. A dull knife actually damages the cells in the fish, thereby altering the taste of the sushi. Whatever you do, don't let go of that. Don't let go of that no matter what happens. Okay. This is extremely dangerous, and the trick here is to apply just the right amount of pressure at just the right angle, a skill gained after years of practice. Sort of, oh, I'm, look what I'm doing, a terrible job on that. So you're moving it, you're not, you're not keeping it at the keeping same angle. Keeping the angle, so the important part is to keep the same angle as I push it down. And I didn't ruin that knife, did I? Did I ruin that knife? Well, that darling knife. If you kept going, you would, you would have if ruined it. If I had kept going, I would have ruined it. Obviously, the edge isn't finished yet. Using a smaller wheel than a whetstone, the blade is honed to razor quality sharpness. <laughs> oh, oh, you can cut your hair too. Yeah, yeah. So they, but I wear a toupee, so this is very it's un un unnecessary for me. So, oh shoot! Ago, everyone, I just yeah, I felt that on my hair. I think this knife is done. <laughs> Actually, it's not. It needs a handle. What we have here is a finished traditional Japanese carving knife, complete with its wooden handle. This is forged from carbon steel, handcrafted, and with the signatures carved into the blade. The only thing left is to actually use this bad boy. So we're at Uedia, and we brought our knife, the one we've been forging over the past couple of days. Paul, our trusty interpreter, you will take your seat at the bar. I'm going to go back into the kitchen. Oh, wait, there's a... I present to you the knife. Should I come across on this side and watch? Okay. Give it, give it. Okay, I'm going to actually try now to, well, using our knife that we forged and made. Uh, this is the first time I've cut sashimi, so like this, like this. Okay, and then he said to use the whole blade. Oh, wow, I'm making wool. Wow, I'm making... You know what? Is it moving? Moving, <laughs> yes, yes. He said it's still alive. It's still moving. It is still alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That was good. I just got the worst heebie jeebies. Oh, wait, that's on. This one's dead, right? Okay. Okay. Okay, so I have now completed this with the application of the lime. And behold, this lovely plate of sashimi. These knives may be strong, but they're also amazingly delicate. To give you an idea of how delicate these knives are, if you don't wipe them after every use, after one slice of the fish, it begins to rust. This is the knife we just made, and after I used it once, I've already kind of botched this knife and it needs repolishing. Um, okay. Paul, would you like to try? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good, thanks. I don't eat fish. Right. Can I get you a pint instead? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have a pint. No sashimi. Is that how it goes? But at any point, the steel could break. Unbelievable. It looked like it was going to break, and it, it didn't. Amazing. He almost cut that block in half. Just enough space, bent it back, and folded it over. He's going to do this multiple times, maybe 10, 15 more. It depends on the smith. I've come full circle to where my journey began. And as rain begins to fall over Tokyo, I duck into an antique shop to follow one last lead in the mystery. Hello? Uh, hello? No more. 
Are you Shimizu san? Hi. I'm Josh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you very much. Yoshitaka Shimizu is a renowned sword collector, and Paul Martin is a noted British curator here to evaluate the latest addition to Mr. Shimizu's collection. How long have you been dealing in, in swords? My family has been collecting swords since 1874. Your family's been, been dealing in swords since 1874. What is it for you about these objects that makes them so special? I think that, that learning about Japanese swords is one of the fastest ways to understand Japanese culture. Would you like to see, he's got a very special sword here, would you like to see it? A very special sword? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Terrific, thank you. My journey across Japan has all led to this. Beautiful box. This sword came to Mr. Shimizu from an anonymous private collector. But is it the sacred blade I've been searching for? I mean, when you look at it on the edge, it's just impossibly sharp. Could this be the Hanjo? No, it is not the Hanjo, but it is a treasure. Absolutely stunning. The edge just vanishes. I mean, it just goes to nothing, it feels like. How old is this blade? Sorry, just over 600 years old. Just over 600 years old. And the, and the sword maker? Masamune. Masamune. This is a Masamune? Right? Yeah. This is a Masamune? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's amazing. That is absolutely incredible. It is beautiful. This katana was forged by the hands of Japan's most venerated sword maker. And although it's not the Hanjo, to hold one of the master's creations is more than I ever expected. There's something so balanced about it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, it, feels, it, feels, it, feels, it feels sort of... Alive in the hand. Yeah, it feels sort of perfect. Yeah. It just looks terrifyingly sharp. Yeah. Now very sharp. Yeah. Well, the first time I saw a real Japanese sword like this, I was uh, profoundly moved. They do kind of touch the soul. You're surprised at their beauty and, and how deep an object they are. It's a intrinsically beautiful art object. On top of that, it, you know, they're very cool weapons. That's just what attracts everyone, <laughs> right. you know. But then once you get past that, you realize it's a spiritual object, a religious object, you know, and all these different myriad of, of meanings that they have. And you, you get sucked in. A lot like Japan itself. Well, not the, uh, not the Hanjo Masamune, but a Masamune. Masamune. Yeah, I'll certainly settle for that. It is absolutely stunning. <laughs>